Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Jackie Ornamont visiting you uh, virtually from Hanover, New Hampshire, um, where I am a professor uh, in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program at Dartmouth, uh, and also the director for the Digital Humanities and Social Engagement Cluster. I want to take a quick minute at the beginning to thank Ray uh, and his team for both the invitation to join you. Um, I'm delighted. DHSI has long been a part of my sort of regular academic life, um, and I'm sad that I can't be there with you in person. I'll uh, mention that recording a talk is a strange thing to do. Uh, it's not just weird to read this paper here while sitting in my house, um, but I really value the presence of being um, together with folks, and I tend to think that a, a significant part of a talk is embodied performance. I like audience energy, uh, even if it also terrifies me, uh, and I sincerely wish that I was there with you. I've learned a lot from Sean Wilson's notion of research as ceremony, and I particularly appreciate his recognition of what people say no to when they say yes to being together at an event. I love saying yes to uh, thinking, making, breaking, uh, learning together. Uh, this time, however, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, my body right, ultimately has said that I've got to attend to its yelps and pleas, no more saying no to my body in order to say yes. Uh, like all discs in a spine, uh, mine are degenerating, but they're doing so faster than average, uh, something like 20 years faster. Uh, and it's worth knowing that it's entirely on brand for me uh, that even the slight jelly discs in my back are in a hurry to grow up or I suppose as I'm now uh, reaching into the middle of my life, grow old. Um, so travel to UBC's uh, Haystack for the amazing conversations about Indigenous-centric scholarship and teaching and to the earlier conversations in Vancouver at Simon Fraser's Digital Democracies event wore out my body, even as it filled my mind and heart. I've done a lot of saying yes this spring and I've learned, uh, perhaps the hard way, that I need to do less of it in order to stay out of pain and to make it, to, to make it possible to say yes to events when I want to, like this one. So I appreciate you saying yes with me uh, and to being here with me, even if I'm only here virtually. Uh, rest assured, in addition to this uh, video capture here, I'm on Twitter with you now in real time. Having talked a little bit about why I'm not there, um, I'd like to take a moment and talk about why I am here and that here is as a member of the DH community. I've always been a little bit of a strange bird, um, studying molecular biology along with English literature, managing nightclubs, and then going into academia, part of a lineage of Iowa farmers with multiple family members in the military, but also raised upper middle class white um, with the American privileges of a you know, girl who grew up in Colorado. Even in my most disciplined moments of fitting in, um, which I think probably were in graduate school in my first years on the job market, I was a Renaissance scholar who wrote a dissertation on mathematics and poetry as possible worlds technologies, and who openly talked about wanting to render poetry as 3D objects that we could throw around the room. I spent three years on the market before finding a position in which I could stay with my partner, who is also an academic. And then I spent 10 years at assistant while giving birth to two children, miscarrying one, experiencing pretty wicked postpartum depression, and moving jobs and locations three times. That I'm now introduced as a, a distinguished chair of digital humanities and social engagement here at Dartmouth often leaves me feeling a little bit bewildered. And um, I'm entirely committed to using the affordances of this position to lift up the great scholars, thinkers, makers, breakers, and killjoys around me. I'm also fairly committed to being a digital humanist, although I have to admit that uh, it's harder on some days than it is on others. I've been watching the debate around computational literary studies with a fair degree of horror, horror that it continues to be centered as the version of DH in the popular press, Horror at the personal attacks and horror, to be totally frank, uh, that this is what people are choosing to spend their time fighting over as our seas rise, tornadoes spin widely, and black, brown, and indigenous people in North America continue to die due to systematic racism, neo-colonial indifference, and outright campaigns of destruction. Honestly, when trans people are being murdered and women are being legislatively reimagined or just continuously imagined as vessels for white supremacist nation building, 
I find it horrifying that people are devoting significant resources to fighting over the value of computing genre in a limited literary corpus. Now, before anyone gets upset, let me be clear. Uh, I'm not, while I'm not a computational literary studies person, I don't take issue with its existence as a set of methods. Uh, I don't dispute the intellectual value of debate over methods, nor do I even worry particularly about the, you know, the time people might spend classifying literary genres. I don't have a sense um, that these are wastes of time in any respect. That said, in a moment where algorithmic methods are driving uh, cloud storage facilities to displace communities of color, they're slurping up natural resources at alarming rates, being used right now to train weapons of war, when our faces uh, have become something to be mined in public along with our words and the words of our forebears, I do wonder about where people choose to put their time and considerable, considerable intellectual power. In 2015, while I was working with the Digital Alchemists on the Center for Solutions to Online Violence, a woman looked up at the room uh, and asked mostly the white scholars there, what are you doing in your work to stop black death? At that point, I was already shifting my scholarship, but it took a really sharp turn in the days, weeks, and months that followed that question. I now regularly ask myself, what am I doing in order to ensure that we all get more free? Not to ensure just bare life, but that the full futures are there for black, brown, indigenous people to realize the shape, uh, for indigenous people to realize and shape in their own ways. So essentially I'm saying there, right, I want to create the conditions or support the conditions of possibility where people are not simply surviving, but thriving. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, that entails helping those of us who have been most significantly oppressed over our long histories um, be lifted up. What am I doing, I ask myself, to ensure that my human kin, men, women, gender fluid and gender non-conforming people, are free. What am I doing to ensure that my non-human kin, the bees, the whales, the mushrooms, and the dandelions are also free? Now, if you find yourself thinking, oh God, this is going to be one of those talks, and I'll be honest, I'm thinking it even as I was writing it and perhaps even as I'm performing it. Join me in taking a minute to reflect on why that might be our first impulse. I'm always acutely aware of the disciplinary and patriarchal forms that encourage me to feel weird about talking about myself, my feelings, other people, nature, uh, aware that at least partially abstracted ideas and concepts feel much easier, safer, to be totally honest, they feel more appropriate in the academic setting in some ways. I'm often aware that being political or engaged is read, especially if you're not a cis male, as being soft, emotional, or irrational. I opened uh, my piece, Knowing Why Revolution Must Come, Digital Humanities as Poetry and Prayer for, for American Quarterly with Joy Harjo's Eagle poem, which is uh, there on the right hand of the screen. She observes that to pray, you open your whole self to the world. This is an act not only of openness, but also humility. You have to know that there is more that you can't see, can't hear. Uh, if I'm being totally honest, I still feel like I want to vomit when I think about that piece. Not because it's bad, but because it violates a lot of the academic norms or the norms of academic writing. And I literally imagine, even in this moment, many of my respected colleagues rolling their eyes as they read it or hear me talking about it. So here I am, sitting in my feelings, feelings that I've learned from a system that has devalued bodies, rituals, prayer, commune, and collectivity, and asking all of us to take a minute to inhabit humility and to think, what are we doing to ensure that our work is ensuring that we are all more free? Said again, uh, because it was a little jumbled, what are we doing in our work to ensure that we are all more free? Now, at this point, um, after I've sat in my feelings for a second, is where I get to start talking about sex. I wrote this book. Uh, in the book, I spend time thinking about the histories of our quantifying technologies, 
recalling, again, uh, as I said, that I'm a little bit of a weird bird, um, I also collaborate with others uh, to create installations or events that help us think about how digital technologies quantify, monitor, and imagine us and in order to think about how we might make what Wendy Chun has called the promiscuity of our computational devices more visible, tangible even, so that people can assess their own relationships to that computational promiscuity. Uh, and here on the left side, you have the Living Net, um, which is a piece that has, I think, shown in six or seven different locations globally. Um, in the center there is my collaborator, Jessica Ryko, um, who may or may not be in the audience there with you all today. If so, Give her some extra love for me. Wish I was there to see you. Um, and then on the right is a related event called uh, Vibrant Lives, where um, we had a sculpture that vibrated with people's cell phone data. Um, in both the Living Net and in Vibrant Lives, the sculptural pieces vibrated with um, sonified and haptified data from people's cell phones, essentially giving people a way to feel the amount of data shed that they created as they were using their devices or even just carrying them um, around. All right, so back to the book. Uh, I tend to frame uh, the book in terms of wounds or perhaps matrices is the more appropriate way to say it here. Um, I ground my media history in matrices. And for those of you who are word nerds, you'll know that matrix can refer to wounds as well as to mathematical and biological forms. I very much like those resonances, and it makes sense to me that matrix might be what Susan Lee Starr has described as a boundary term or object. That is something that can be used in lots of really disparate dis disciplines um, in productive ways. So I'm using what Vivian uh, M. May has called the matrix logic that is a hallmark, according to her scholarship, um, of intersectional work. And for those of you who don't know this, uh, this is a theory, intersectionality, um, intersectional work is a theory and a practice that has been developed and deployed in a long lineage of black feminist scholarship and action, um, which includes Kimberly Crenshaw and others. Uh, and it's also worth noting, right, that there's a lot of discussion about uh, it being a bit fashionable these days um, for white settler scholars like myself to be using black Latinx and indigenous theories uh, in our thinking, and I'm happy to talk with folks about how I'm navigating this as a, a white settler scholar. And essentially, the key for me is to cite, 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 right? Um, but also to read deeply. Reading one Crenshaw essay will not make you an intersectional feminist. And additionally, if you're not using intersectionality in your work in the service of greater freedoms for women of color in particular, then you might want to stop and consider if you're appropriating rather than engaging in learning. But back to the womb. The matrix logic that I'm using in Numbered Lives focuses on simultaneous and enmeshed multiplicities, including but not limited to those of race and gender. It also entails commitment to a resistant forms of knowing and eradicating epistemological, material, and structural inequality, two commitments that I have learned from feminists of color in particular. The matrix logic of intersectional feminism considers how inequalities intermingle and emphasizes linkages between the structural and experiential and the material and the discursive. Now, speaking of matrices, uh, foregrounds the structural nature of power as highlighted, as highlighted in intersectional theory. Uh, so, for example, we can think here of Patricia Hill Collins' formulation of the matrix of domination. Collins frames the matrix of domination as, and I'm quoting here, the overall social organization of intersection, intersecting oppressions, end quote, and draws our attention to context-specific matrices, right? So it's not as if there's like a single matrix that we're all in, uh, whatever the film might wish us to think, um, but instead to think about the ways in which power overlaps to make particular identities and particular bodies more vulnerable um, or less desirable to the state. So the context-specific matrix of my book, Numbered Lives, is that of the long Anglo-American tradition that stretches back at least to the early part of the 16th century. And part of what I'm hoping to share in Numbered Lives is a deeper understanding of how quantum media, that is media that count, participate in the creation and maintenance of presumed natural qualities that are then inscribed as race, gender, or citizenship. 
So in the book, I think a lot about how whiteness has been constructed in Anglo-American contexts using these media, media that cast life and death in terms of numbers. I also think about how different media have been used to measure and track black and to a lesser extent, brown and indigenous bodies, not as lives and deaths, but instead as property and losses. So uh, that gives you a sense of the frame of the book and some of its uh, context. And um, part of what I'm gonna do now is situate all of us in the contemporary moment with uh, quantified self and then move back and forth in time. So for those of you who might not spend as much time as I do wondering how and why we count people, let me give you a sense of what's cool these days in terms of tracking. And since we're talking about sex, that's where we will start again. So this is first before we get to the sex stuff. Uh, these are some of the first covers that sort of inaugurated what's known as the quantified self movement. Um, and uh, Gary Wolf, Wolf and Kelly, yeah, are uh, the two names who are sort of associated with launching both quantified labs, um, but also the movement itself. All right. So quantified self and wearables are uh, big business these days. According to an IDC report in 2018, 172.2 million wearables shipped worldwide. And that was a 31% increase over 2017. Uh, CCS Insights estimates that the 2019, our current market uh, in wearables is worth $25 billion, right? Uh, this is no small thing. And I'm, imagine, or I'm interested in how tech is being imagined in ways that fall in line with historical trends around the quantification of human sexual activity and function. Although, as you'll see here, I've written about the gendering of the larger marketplace as well. So this research has uh, taken me into the first half of the 20th century. And right now I'm doing work on the quantitative studies conducted by Alfred Kinsey and colleagues at the University of Indiana. Um, and I'll say that this is a particularly rich site for a DHer like me, given that Kinsey and colleagues not only quantified uh, human sexuality and sexual history, but they also did it um, while using punch card technology and large scale data analysis. Now Kinsey's studies were interested in binary gendered ex sexual experiences, but there's a noticeable asymmetry in his interest in the physical structure of the vagina and that of the penis. Vaginas only appear in the Kinsey data as gateways to the womb or uterus, or as a trace of sexual activity. He and his colleagues, uh, as you'll see up in the, the top table there, uh, asked about various kind of menstrual features, right? So age of first menstruation, menstrual duration, um, and the technologies that women were using to handle menstrual flow. But the only question about the physical structure of either the vagina or the clitoris is about the hymen, actually, uh, and its rupture, not about the physical features of uh, what we tend to think of today as um, the organs involved in women's sexual pleasure. Now, where vaginas and wombs, uteruses are being quantified today, we see a similar focus on menstruation in today's quote unquote smart devices. Uh, here on the left, you have the loon cup, um, which measures volume and color of menstrual blood. Um, this is not yet a product that has been rolled out. It was um, funded at an absolutely absurd rate uh, on Kickstarter and then received um, more than a million dollars in VC funding, um, but they are more than three years behind on product shipment for those uh, who invested in the Kickstarter campaign. Um, on the right hand side there is something uh, newer which is called the Smart Tampon um, and is developed by a corporation called Next Gen Jane. And the idea um, is that someone could track their fertility and uh, menstrual habits uh, with a, a quote unquote smart tampon. Not, pre not present in the Kinsey data, but likely to show up when I get to doing research on other quantifications by Anglo-American sexologists are questions about the musculature of the vagina. And of course, unsurprisingly, perhaps we have both apps and teledildonic devices for that today. Uh, so these are a couple of examples, the LV Trainer and uh, Love Life's Crush, um, which are both designed for strengthening the Kegel muscles that form the pelvic floor. Now, penises uh, in both the quantified sex of the 20th century and today get a different kind of treatment. Kinsey and his team asked interviewees about the length, 
girth, direction, and angle of both the flaccid and erect penis, even asking about the dressing or the orientation in trousers of the member. The concern for penile dimensions continues uh, in the 21st century quantified penis. This up on the uh, left side there is the icon smart condom, um, which I want to take a minute and note is not a condom at all. Um, it doesn't protect or stop um, any fluids being uh, part of sexual transmission. Um, it doesn't protect against STIs. Um, there is in fact no thing that sort of goes over the entirety of the penis um, with the icon. It's instead more like a sleeve um, and users are asked to wear an additional condom um, if they're looking to have protected sex. Um, so the icon there measures physical features such as skin temperature, the girth of the penis, it also adds in some new mechanical metrics, including the number of thrusts and thrust velocity during sexual activity. It also will track the number of positions and the duration and frequency of sexual sessions. And it will tell you about the calories that you've burned in the process. And it's important to note that, um, right, not only are these devices, but they're also linked, right? Um, they're Bluetooth, or low Bluetooth, or some other kind of communicating device. And this was true for the women's smart technology also. Um, but they're working with apps, right? Um, and the apps are the things that feed back that information. On the right-hand side, those two rings that you see um, are known as the sex fit, uh, which drawing on the notion of the Fitbit, right, um, are thinking about performance data for sex lives. Um, they describe this as calories burnt, duration, and thrusts per minute in addition to any uh, is, um, measurements of erection, et cetera. Uh, a similar set of metrics is core uh, to sexual activity track tracking apps as well. Um, here you have in the center a screen grab from Slog, um, which isn't the name that I would give to a sex activity tracker, um, kind of casts sex activity in a, a, a less than salutary light. Um, a similar one uh, that I believe is now defunct um, was known as Spreadsheets. But all of these apps that exist out there will track the thrusts, number, and velocity of sexual encounters. They'll track sound volume and duration if you're willing to conduct your sex on a bed or other single piece of furniture and have your phone out at the same time. Now it's worth noting that the tracking apps in particular, which rely on the phone's microphone, gyroscope, and accelerometer, seem to imagine sexual activity as a supine single location event where a phone can unobtrusively, unobtrusively sit nearby. It's a very particular kind of sexual activity that's being monitored here. And just like the metrics gathered by penis wearables um, are interested in, ver in a very particular way of understanding the member, right? So there's, there's a way in which these quantifying technologies sort of narrow the range of what counts, right, uh, as sexual activity, in part because of um, their technical or mechanical, um, whether you want to call them affordances or limitations. So at this very early stage in my work on the history of quantified sex, I'm not sure that I can make any definitive statements about the relationships between Kinsey's data collection and that of our more contemporary devices. I do see that the asymmetry that is present in the Kinsey data, where vaginas and wombs are really only assessed in terms of sexual activity and maturity, penises are subject to all kinds of measurement. Uh, and that same sort of interest is reproduced in modern quantified self or quantified sex devices. This is a com uh, kind of common thread in my work um, where what seems like the brand new media of today is actually is detailed as actually part of a much longer lineage of quantifying practices that may have taken different media forms, but still carry with them the older ideologies and politics. In this case, here of our quantified sex devices, this would be a privileging of the penis as the sexual organ, while the vagina and uterus are imagined more as receptacles. Um, and as Karen Newman has noted, this is a very old schema indeed. Um, also what we see here is the enlightenment drive to know through study and quantification, whether for intellectual mastery or embodied optimization is a part of the legacy of these newer devices as well. Now this drive to know and optimize in particular brings me back to the question of biopower and biopolitics, um, which is sort of evoked in the, the title of this talk. 
Foucauldian biopower operates across a spectrum that includes at one end disciplinary power as, microphysical, as a microphysical technology of power, one that addresses individual bodies in an effort to optimize both their capabilities and their compliance. On the other end of the spectrum, we have regulatory power, a kind of macro scientific technology of power that attends to the health of the population as an entity. When one is operating in a, a neoliberal context dominated by individual responsibility as we are in the United States and perhaps across Anglo-American contexts, biopower operates through non-state as well as state formations. As Nicholas Rose suggests, neoliberal biopower, and I'm quoting here, governs at a distance, end quote, uh, convincing citizens to shape their own bodies and behaviors to norms that are established through the authority of expert knowledge. You know, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is like, where is the locus of expertise, um, right? In the case of something like uh, the Kinsey data, the expertise is in the scholarly researchers, right? Um, they're the ones who are sort of summing and feeding back. Uh, in the case of quantified self devices, the, the nature of the expertise is much different. Um, and I, that's a thing that I hope to unpack further in the future. But I think um, we would do well to attend to the ways in which our devices might be feeding back information to us that purports to be expertise. But given that we don't know its origins or its source, um, or for that matter, any work that's been put into um, how they were developed, I think we um, would do well to question the nature of that expertise. All right, so in this biopower um, framework um, that Foucault has laid out, we end up uh, with technologies of the self that coexist with technologies of state power. And they coexist uh, in order to manage human life at both individual and population scales, right? So um, essentially in the, you know, if we're thinking about the poles of um, biopower, they're ranging across the scale of human life, right, from individual to larger um, state-managed collectives. So we've got penile rings that will me measure girth for individual edification, and then perhaps feedback expert or collective data about thrust, presumably for some sort of optimization. Uh, now note, the ways in which this individual technology, it's a loop, right, individual technology expert. Uh, leads out the other partner who's presumably a part of sexual activity. Now that strikes me as a particularly neoliberal feature of quantified sex, isolating the individual who is actually part of a communal system in order to foreground metrics and personal responsibility for optimization. Now, in addition, I think these devices of quantified sex are enacting a kind of anatomization or piecing as Jasbir Puar frames it, a kind of piecing of the human body. And Puar observes that this is an elemental aspect of neoliberal biomedical approaches to bodies. And I think it's important also to the creation of bodies and their activities um, as what Snyder and Mitchell have described as multi-sectional markets. Now this piecing is perhaps less apparent in the histories that I tell in Numbered Lives, um, where essentially the, the two technologies are the, the sort of tabular death count and the um, step tracker. And so walking and dying are really the two major activities, right? Um, but they do have certain commonalities. And if you'll uh, indulge me for a moment, I'm going to step back into some of that work uh, to explain. So among the first known quantum media in early modern Europe was this device, which appears in Leonardo da Vinci's Codus Atlanticus, a gathering of manuscript pages which were written between 1478 and 1519 sometimes referred to as a perambulator, a waywiser, a pedometer, or an odometer, the device is not actually named in the manuscript itself. Instead, we have three views on the device, which resembles a wheelbarrow and measures distance with a gear system that drops a stone for every full rotation of the large wheel. Now, while da Vinci's measuring and recording device is perhaps the earliest drawn uh, in Europe, it certainly wasn't um, the first non-textual quantum media. And I think this is important to sort of decenter our, uh, the kind of emphasis on Anglo-American technology uh, histories. The Inca, for example, were already using Kipu, a complex textile counting and recording system to not only count individuals, but to record productivity in mines and keep inventory in storehouses. Now we have 
a handful of remaining examples. The Da Vinci um, device does not appear to have ever actually been fabricated, um, although we do know that shortly thereafter, um, in the 1525 range, um, we get the first uh, Wayweiser way being used um, to measure uh, the size of the Earth. <clears throat> Okay, so these examples here, um, uh, the one on the left is by Daniel DeLander, uh, English clockmaker, and many of these devices were made by clockmakers. It's a partial artifact. Um, it's a bronze dial that measures um, in miles, furlongs, and poles. And it probably sat in a hand box or something larger, perhaps pushed. Um, the hand box you can sort of see in that middle uh, image there. That piece is dated 1590 um, and is currently held at the German National Museum in Nuremberg. Germany, which was then part of the Holy Roman Empire, seems to have been a center of way wiser innovation, including the smaller and more body friendly brass and silver cord. Uh, brass and silver cord operated uh, Wildebrand pedometer on the far right. Um, and what the, the body worn ones would have done is that little um, loop that's up there in the corner would have had a cord through it. That cord would have attached at the hip, the knee, and the ankle of the wearer, and the movement of the leg would have mechanically advanced the dials. Now, the artistry and materials of these devices testify to their status as instruments for the wealthy. Made of heavy brass and silver, they are framed with elaborate floral etchings, and they capture human activity in the same kinds of interfaces usually reserved for the marking of time and celestial movements. Expensive, heavy, and durable, European waywisers and pedometers were initially used not to track human activity, but instead for cartographic work. In the Royal Society proceedings and other technical publications, the pedometer was described as a, and I'm quoting here, new geographical instrument, which attached to a man or to the horse's saddle, uses the steps to display the length of the journey one has made, end quote. Initially, these devices flourished not because of an interest in human activity in and of itself, but rather because human and or animal motion, that is walking or riding, was used as a proxy to measure distance. In these situations, quantum media were leveraged as a way of making land claims, transforming matters of value for emerging nation states, such as the existence and control of natural resources, into matters of international fact. This was no small feat in an era where standardized measurement was not yet a reality. Pedometers and waywisers then were central to the kind of fixing and demarcating of territory that Foucault points to as foundational to territorial systems of imperial power. While measuring land can seem rather banal and the aesthetic appeal of early waywisers can draw excited attention, both the banality and the elegance of the devices obscures a fundamental truth about these media. They were literally instrumental to colonial occupation to the work of seizing, delimiting, and asserting control over a geographic area, of writing on the ground a new set of social and spatial relations. Now this matters not only for our understanding of the politics of space in the colonial era, but also for unpacking the cultural imaginaries that have been, constitutive, have been a constitutive part of human activity tracking. I'm quoting here, uh, these imaginaries, Achille Mbembe observes, uh, give meaning to the enactment of differential rights to differing categories of people for different purposes within the same space, end quote. To walk or ride with a pedometer or waywiser was to engage in the production of nation, Anglo-subjecthood, and to participate in the violences that attended such production. To map space in the early modern period was an exercise in the production of the idea and the material realities of the early nation state. Land measurements were done to assess taxes, to estimate the value of royal hunting land and forestry assets, to cordon off pastures and grazing lands, and to delimit territory for the purposes of laying claim to natural resources, such as minerals, jewels, and water. Individual human bodies walked or rode across the land while new quantifying media measured either the steps or the rotation of a wheel. 
In some instances, these devices even printed out their data on spools of punctured paper designed to help cartographers track and map the terrain traveled. These measurements were then integrated into official state and imperial documents that declared terrestrial spaces as part of an ever expanding empire. Royal decrees, official record books, and newly popular books of maps remediated measurements of human travel into demonstrations of dominion and fiscal ownership and responsibility. Um, and I'll note here that Molly Farrell has a really excellent study of how uh, some of the similar, how similar actions were taken on um, colonial plantation islands. Um, and I have um, some discussion in my book of uh, the colonial efforts uh, here in the US as well. Now returning to our anatomized body and quantified sex. Uh, echoing the historical roots of quantum mediation and colonial land theft that I just detailed, Puar notes that the modern body has, quote, become a terrain of definable localities, each colonized by its particular pathologies, dictated by the medicalized marketplace, end quote. So even in these very distant seeming devices, right, um, it seems like a very long way from something like these pedometers um, in early modern England, um, to something like a penis ring or the very poorly named smart condom, the specter of colonial land theft and the imperial enlightenment and capitalist logics thereof haunt the shiny new devices. Rather than carving up stolen lands for the purposes of resource extraction and settlement, these logics are now being used to carve up the human body. And I think uh, this is uh, real quick, a, a example of one of the pushed waywisers. Um, so these logics are now being used to carve up the human body, and I think we would do well to consider whether or not resource extraction and settlement are also at work uh, here in quantified sex. All right, so now we're going to move into the 19th century here. Um, so we've gone from the early modern period, um, and in the book there's some discussion of um, a kind of late 18th, early 19th century, um, both British and American uh, interest in pedometers and step tracking. And part of what I do there is note the, the shift that happens um, where suddenly, not suddenly, it happens over the course of 15 years. Um, there are new claims about what pedometers can do that are not only cartographic, but they're about health. Um, pick up the book if you'd like to see more of that. Okay, so here you have uh, the American pedometer, which debuted at the end of the 19th century. Um, and by the time the American pedometer, this is the first one that was patented and made in the US. Um, the, it's clearly figured as a biomedia that exists in addition to, or as a supplement to the use of waywisers um, or pedometers in Europe and in the US for geographical surveying. 19th century Americans, according to uh, the ads that, uh, celebrated these devices, were supposed to be interested in tracking for individual health and recreation. And this particular American pedometer was lauded for being more effective at that than um, the ones that were being used for cartographic work. So I'm reading from an ad um, for the American pedometer here. It says, walking, especially in the open air, is acknowledged to be the most economical, most enjoyable, and in many respects, the most healthful form of physical exercise. Now these devices were initially uh, sold exclusively by Tiffany & Co, and the five to seven dollar purchase price at the time was roughly equivalent to a hundred or hundred and fifty dollar device today. Then, as now, the affordability of quantum media was a relative measure, making the self-regulation that is imagined under neoliberal biopolitics part of the economic and social differentiation in the United States. Um, and another way of saying that, right, is that Activity trackers have always been about marking affluence, race, gender, and citizenship. As the use of pedometers begins uh, to include straight white presenting women at the turn of the 20th century, there's a rise in ambivalent reports about pedometer usage in the context of elite social cultures. This is from uh, the 1908 Washington Times Magazine section, which ran a two-page spread uh, on the pedometer fad at debutante balls, which included a nearly full page graphic. Uh, that's the one where it starts at the top with the Newport Tango meters. 
Um, nearly a full page graphic that featured elegantly clad women with pedometers discreetly hid beneath expensive gowns or tucked into bodices. Oh, and I'm sorry, I actually, uh, it's the center one there is the one um, that was the top part of that full page um, ad. Uh, the text at the bottom um, of that full page ad reports, and I'm quoting here, um, after an evening at a ball, the debutante can glance at her little pedometer and say to her escort in all truthfulness, well, I've danced just 21 miles this evening, um, right? And the, um, the notion here is that you've got these elegantly clad women who have the pedometers either sort of discreetly tucked into their bodices or suspended um, at their, their knees, um, as in that other cartoon, or perhaps even at the ankle. The piece goes on to suggest, and I'm quoting again, that the pedometer is all the rage in large cities, having been imported from the London debutante scene. Suggesting that, quote, no bud is truly elite unless she has a little ticker attached to her bodice. And going on to suggest, if one is close enough to the young debutante, one can hear the merry tick, tick, tick of the little instrument, end quote. These descriptions were clearly meant to titillate in addition to standing as evidence of a woman's status as a nationally prized bud, presumably destined to help the nation flower. It at once positions a quantum media, here the pedometer, as a necessary accessory for cultural prominence, and it promises men an auditory experience that verifies physical proximity to the nation's most desirable crop. The article goes on to note, quote, the facts shown by figures may well be incredible, but they are nevertheless true, end quote. Again, depending on the power of quantum media to contain the, um, what it seems incredible, right? For example, that a debutante could possibly be dancing all the way across the nation in the course of a, a season. Um, containing the incredible um, with the remediation uh, that I describe in the book as aesthetic rationalism, right? So that's essentially a situation in which the numerical um, packaged in very particular ways is a way of um, wrapping one's head um, mind around uh, the incredible scale of activity, incredible scale of the nation, incredible scale of, of death, etc. Now, while the presence of the pedometer positions the young women as cosmopolitan, elite, and desirable even in their labors, a cartoon appears five years later in the Richmond Times Dispatch, and that's actually this Newport Tango Meters, and then um, this is the cartoon um, in detail uh, here on the right-hand side, suggests that the step counting, counting craze had threatened the social networking and partner, partnering function of the balls as the women became more fixated on the numbers than on their dancing partners. Lamenting a perceived spoiling of the dance craze, or of the season by the craze, uh, the cartoon and article to which it was attached suggests that in instead of the appropriate work of nation and family building, the pedometer wearing women are creating a spectacle in which the debutante is anxiously monitoring her steps while her dance partner sweats with exertion. The pedometer-driven competition amongst the nation's debutantes, according to this article, threatened to transform balls into sporting events that leveraged men's physical exertion in dancing rather than serving masculinized heterosexual desires for reproductive sex and matrimony. So we have a trajectory in which pedometers are first used in the service of imperial territorial power and then come to serve as media technologies for regulating not only imperial space, but also the imperial and neo-imperial subject. Measuring largely the health and vigor of affluent white, straight male citizens in Britain and the US, step counting devices had become a way of attesting to the well-being of both the individual and the nation. This carried over into the activity tracking of straight affluent white women in the debutante scene, who are clearly imagined as uh, demonstrating not only their own sexualized vigor, but also the hearty vigor of an imagined heterosexual nation. However, it quickly became possible to encode the emergent competition amongst women as a risk to the nation and its masculine fecundity, 
where female participation in tracking cultures begins to interfere with sexual function with the sexual function of the debutante ball, it was quickly derided and tamped down. Now, I don't think it's a, a mere coincidence that this is the same historical moment that is the first half of the 20th century when weight measurement becomes a significant mediation of the individual female body and of women's bodies as a class. Again, sort of um, at those two poles of the Foucauldian biopolitics. Um, and a lot of this work has, um, or a lot of this history has been detailed by Crawford Lingle and Carpi. Uh, further, this is the same time um, in which domestic engineering crazes sweep across the U.S. Um, and as they do, they use things like pedometers. And I've got a lot of um, this work in my book, um, right? They're using pedometers as a way of um, arguing that women's homemaking is in fact work. And while this can seem like it's a liberatory um, kind of action, um, it was partly in order to entice white women back into the home after World War I. So if we take the first half of the 20th century as a sort of single historical period here, then this is also the same period in which Kinsey and his colleagues begin to treat sexual activity as a thing that can be categorized and enumerated in the service of a large scale effort to understand human sexuality, right? So this is a, a, a way of sort of temporally and conceptually connecting um, what seem to be very distant things, right? The land tracking um, or land measurement of the early imperial or colonial periods in both Britain and the US, and then um, on into the sort of um, domestic engineering craze, the debutantes, um, the health and fitness tracking for uh, white Anglo men um, or Anglo-American men, um, and then on into the quantification of sex. So as I discuss in Numbered Lives, the tracking of births and rates of reproduction in the course of creating life tables is certainly as old as mortality tracking itself and was absolutely a central part of the biopolitical projects of both the British Empire and American statecraft. But I think it's in these first, uh, this first 50 years of the 20th century that we really begin to see large-scale, well-funded, systematic collection of numbers on reproductive body parts and sexual activities. So we're in this moment then, um, right, in the first half of the 20th century, when the imperial, patriarchal, and capitalist logics of Anglo-America are being performed in and through these media that count human bodies and human activity. And what's more, they're proliferating, right? They're, not, they're no longer about you know, overall vigor and uh, simply you know, outdoor exercise or hunting and mapping, um, but instead proliferating into all domains of human activity from the woman's home and her homemaking practices to something like the sexual practices of both um, people with penises and people with vaginas uh, in the consideration of the Kinsey study. So this proliferation continues and accelerates as computing power increases, costs decrease, and computational habits become more firmly entrenched in white affluent Anglo-American lifestyles. And sexual activity and sexuality are firmly tangled up in these trends and they become sites for study, surveillance, and optimization. Sex then becomes not just biopower at the population scale, but at the individual scale as well. Now, as I've suggested, the sexual activity portion of this research is new for me, and there's clearly a lot more archival work that I need to do to understand the histories of quantified sex. I've got British studies of sexuality and Masters and Johnson to look forward to, uh, among other things, uh, which include the tracking of enslaved people's fertility and eugenic movements. I'm also stewing in some thoughts about form. Media forms, uh, for example, Kinsey used the tabular form that I talk about as a way of managing death and uncertainty in my book. And I mentioned that he and his team uh, recorded his data on punch cards, um, which is a, of interest to many of us in the DH community. And I'm also interested in numerical data as itself a semiotic form. I'm also interested in understanding more about flows and persistence. How does the data of quantified sex get shared in different historical moments and with different forms? What kinds of persistence or durability is there to this data in its different circulations and formats? 
And this is a question where my commitment to getting us all more free to using digital humanities work, media history work, to help protect vulnerable communities. I argue in the book, here, everywhere really, that the history of quantum media is one of violence and the privileging of affluence, whiteness, and masculinity. Where non-white bodies appear, it is often, too often, as property and or resources to be mined. And this is as true today as it was in the early modern period and across the 18th and 19th centuries. Particular norms of health and wellness, that sort of expertise, technology, wellness matrix, are often weaponized against people of color, particularly those with uteruses. In this context, the quantification uh, and self, uh, sorry, in this context, quantification and self-tracking can in fact be a mode of speaking back to power, as mathematician Dr. Talithia Williams so powerfully demonstrates in her uh, Own Your Own Body, uh, Own Your Body's Data TED Talk. Williams leveraged mathematical expertise in statistics and her own long-standing practice of fertility tracking to push back against uh, doctor's recommendations during the days leading up to her child's birth. When Williams's expertise and experience was discounted as both a woman and a black person, she leveraged tabular media, quantification, and a mathematic rendering of patterns to resist silencing. Now, it's important to note that in this case, uh, it didn't persuade her physicians uh, who continued to use a different set of norming media to try to manage Williams's delivery. It did, however, empower her to feel that her decision to not induce childbirth um, was sound. And Gina Neff and Don Nathus described this kind of quantified uh, self-knowledge as part of a, a human process of uh, discovery and debugging. Um, and we see um, Deborah Lupton has some great work on this. Uh, Kate Crawford has got some work on this, right? So there are a number of scholars who are sort of thinking about the ways in which women and perhaps uh, women of color in particular are able to leverage biometric data um, and their own sort of health tracking or quantification in order to speak back to power. And as Yeshi Milner, uh, the founder of Data for Black Lives reminds us, data is a civil rights tool. Some stories are told in data and can only be refuted or refigured with data. So we need data. But I think we also need careful and nuanced understandings of how our media, our computational technologies, all of these are carrying forward violent ideologies, practices, and material realities. We need media histories that help us understand how whiteness, affluence, expertise, masculinity, and colonialism are created by human techno assemblages. Black pregnancy related deaths are three to four times higher than for white pregnancy in the United States. People of color who seek abortion related care are more likely to die than their white counterparts. And that will only become more true as more restrictive laws are passed, not only in the United States, but in, across North America and Western Europe as well. Meanwhile, the constructions of vigorous white masculinity through wearable devices is expanding into a multi-billion dollar market. As a media historian and a digital humanist, I can turn my interest in quantification, my interests in quantification, so that they serve a better understanding of these histories, these productive techno-human imaginaries, so that we can intervene, we can choose where to put our resources, and create futures that don't simply replicate century-long violences. I would close by asking you, what can you do? Thank you.